So, but first I'm gonna bring out Edward Abrahams, and he is the president of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. Full disclosure, my firm, PwC, is a member of the coalition, and as the name suggests, this is an organization that is dedicated to advancing personalized medicine. So if your organizations are not members, you might want to give that some thought, because this is really the group that is trying to further uh, this research and, and this activity going forward. Ed and I have had the pleasure of, of talking a few times prior to this, and I think what's going to be really nice is that he is going to get into uh, the status of the field. So not only some of the scientific presentations that you've heard here today, but where exactly is personalized medicine or individualized medicine headed? And then we'll have a chance to uh, chat. Again, please take out your apps. Send in some questions while Ed is talking so that when we get into the discussion, you can really be a, a part of the conversation as well. So without further ado, Ed. Thank you very much, CC. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, CC for uh, that warm introduction. And I want to thank the uh, conference organizers for inviting me and the Personalized Medicine Coalition to participate in this important meeting. And finally, I'd like to thank the audience that has hung on uh, into the third day. I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share with you uh, our vision of personalized medicine. And as CC mentioned, uh, it is my intention to put it in a bit of a broader context than we've been talking about so far to give you a sense of uh, what the environment looks like. Uh, I, I, I think that's uh, particularly important. Sometimes when I begin these talks, I, I say that uh, I'm, uh, I'm from Washington and I'm here to help. Um, I'm not sure that that's a good way to start uh, my talk today, given what's going on in Washington and, 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 clear, and how dysfunctional uh, uh, our government is at the moment. But the, concept of the Personalized Medicine Coalition um, and the reason it was created uh, was to harness the power of government to encourage investment in and adoption of personalized medicine. The founders of the Personalized Medicine Coalition uh, back in 2004 realized, I think correctly, that just because the science points us to personalized medicine or precision medicine or individualized medicine, and I'll get into what we, what we call it, that just because the science points us in that direction, it does not follow night the day that patients are going to benefit. The governing hypothesis of the coalition, and I underline the word coalition, is uh, that unless we bring together all the stakeholders around this new paradigm, progress for patients will be slower than it might otherwise be. So we heard a lot of fascinating scientific lectures over the past couple of days that are really exciting about what uh, personalized medicine can do for patients. But I will argue in the next 30, 40 minutes that unless we get the uh, structures correct, and those structures are the space between the science and the patient regarding things like reimbursement, regulation, and clinical adoption. Unless we get those things right, its progress is going to be a lot slower, and maybe, and maybe indeed, isn't going to happen at all, although I'm, not, I'm very optimistic, not pessimistic. Um, I was struck by Dr. Green's uh, introductory uh, remark that at NHGRI, which he heads, uh, we're overachievers, he said. And I think what he was talking about was all that we're learning about the genome and the number of papers that are published. To be sure, we've done much more in terms of publishing papers uh, than uh, one would have expected uh, 10 years ago. I would not say, however, that we're overachievers when it comes to changing the lives of patients, which indeed is what we're all about. I would note there's been remarkable progress, especially in oncology uh, and in other areas. When the Personalized Medicine Coalition first counted the number of personalized medicine products on the market uh, about six years ago, I think we came up with uh, 
14. Today, they're at least over 80. So obviously, there has been incremental progress. But I would argue it's nowhere near as fast as patients expect. And I think we can do better, and, and that is uh, the mission of the Personalized Medicine Coalition, uh, to encourage us to do better. Now, when you listen to somebody talk, it's often useful to ask yourself, what bees are buzzing in that person's bonnet? And so I want to let you know what bees are buzzing in my bonnet. As I say, I'm the president of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. We represent all the stakeholders with an interest in personalized medicine. Uh, and they include insurance companies, diagnostic companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, academic health centers, including Mayo, strategic providers like uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, and my job is to encourage uh, the development of personalized medicine because we think it's a better paradigm and we want to get more investment. So I'm not agnostic about uh, what it is we're talking about at this conference. Um, let me begin uh, by noting uh, that this has been around for a long time. Uh, as Hippocrates said, it's far more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. And I'm reminded of that quote every time I meet a physician who, when I tell them what we do, says, but I've always personalized uh, my treatment of patients. Every time I see a patient, I I, I uh, treat that person uh, on an individual basis. And that indeed is true. Um, at the dawn of modern medicine, Sir William Osler, who's considered the father of modern medicine, noted that if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might be a science, not an art. Now, what's interesting today is thanks to new molecular tools and new understanding of the pathways of disease and wellness, we can move it away from being an art and to become a science. And this has tremendous implications for the practice of medicine, which I will discuss. It's very important to define personalized medicine. And, but briefly, the mantra of personalized medicine is right treatment, right person, right time, right dose. And we want to move from the current practice of one-size-fits-all, trial and error, which really characterizes more of medicine than we'd like to admit, and, and move it into one of uh, targeted therapeutics. Uh, that's our goal. Uh, and we actually, if, if you're a patient, recognize uh, that we got a lot of work to do. Every time you hear your physician say, let's try this, the patient might come back and say, why can't we know? And I would argue, and I will argue this morning, that with more investment, we can know more in advance of prescription. Uh, we at the Personalized Medicine Coalition had been using this definition of personalized medicine, which comes from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Um, I want to reference it because it, I, it's important, uh, and we've moved away from it, uh, and I want to let you know why in a moment. Uh, according to the uh, PCAS, personalized medicine refers to the tailoring of medical treatment to the individual patient to classify individuals into subpopulations. Remember that word, subpopulations, that differ in susceptibility uh, to a particular disease or their response to a specific treatment. Preventive or therapeutic interventions can then be concentrated on those who will benefit, sparing expense and side effects for those who will not. That, in essence, is indeed what personalized medicine is. Uh, but we did some focus groups to, to, to talk, to try to learn what patients, as, as educated patients, hear and think when we talk about personalized medicine. And, we, and they told us they particularly were disturbed by that word subpopulations. They really wanted to understand, and this shouldn't be a great surprise to us, they want to understand what does it mean for me and they don't want to be part of subpopulations. Some of them actually thought that the word had some racist connotations, although obviously it doesn't. It's, 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 it's molecular, it's a molecular level. So we've, uh, we, we're working on a revised definition of uh, personalized medicine uh, that will appeal more to patients. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's what we want to do, is appeal to patients. Um, 
Personalized medicine is an evolving field of medicine that uses molecular, we're adding that word, molecular diagnostic tools to identify specific biological markers, often genetic, but not always genetic, um, to help assess which medical treatments will be best for each patient. By combining the data from these tests with a patient's medical history and circumstances, healthcare providers can develop targeted prevention and treatment plans. And indeed, that's what personalized medicine is, and that's what we were hearing for the past two days. Um, we, as I mentioned, our focus groups, which were highly educated and all across the country, divided into Republicans and Democrats, uh, reacted to the negatively, as you can see from this graph, to the PCAST definition. And the revised definition uh, it was, was one they liked quite a bit. So we, we want to listen to what we're being told, uh, because at the end of the day, we'd like to be appealing uh, to patients, uh, if not scientists and physicians as well. Um, now, there's been a lot of discussion also, and I believe this discussion is significant because it gets to what it is we're talking about, about what we should call this. So uh, scientists actually in, in the last couple of years have preferred the term precision medicine. Significantly, uh, patients don't particularly like that, as you can see from this chart, with the negatives um, uh, on the right side and the positives on the left side. So uh, while Francis Collins, for example, wrote a book called uh, The Language of Life, an Introduction to Personalized Medicine, he now refers to it as precision medicine because they don't scientists in particular don't want to leave the patient with the impression that everyone's going to get a different drug with his or her name on it, though I don't think patients actually expect that. Uh, but, um, so, but that's a term of art now, although I don't think it's replaced personalized medicine, which uh, is regarded favorably. Now, most favorably, interestingly enough, is individualized medicine, which the folks at Mayo had the wisdom to choose. Um, and, and I believe that that has uh, particular valence for patients because patients want to know that it, it's all about them. Um, the good news here is that we learned from our focus groups is that patients are very excited about the opportunities in personalized medicine once it's explained to them. Now, interestingly, I should have said in advance, of 60 people that we talked to in extensive interviews, um, 58 didn't know what personalized medicine was, and the two that thought they did got it wrong. So it, it, that, it, that is daunting for us. We have an enormous amount of educational work to do. Uh, we talk to each other quite a bit um, and, and, uh, at Mayo and, and other places that want to implement personalized medicine or individualized medicine, we have to understand we have an enormous amount of educational work to do um, with the public while not uh, obviously over-promising what it can deliver. But patients are excited about this opportunity and interestingly in our focus groups we learned that they are actually willing to pay a premium uh, for personalized medicine which is interesting because when you survey most people about what, whether they think that they should get a particular drug or a particular therapy, they, obvious, obvious, they totally expect that they should and that it should be free. Um, and that's obviously one of the challenges of the healthcare system. But when we explain personalized medicine, we notice they were willing to invest in it more than otherwise. So what's driving uh, personalized medicine? Uh, first of all, uh, driving it is a need uh, on the part of the population uh, for safer and more effective drugs. Uh, patients want a faster time to cure. They don't care about how many papers you publish. They want to see uh, delivery uh, at the bedside. And then, interestingly enough, uh, there's also a new dynamic uh, in, uh, in healthcare, and that is we've got to find cost-effective solutions. Uh, we can't just, as the payers remind us daily, uh, we can't just uh, uh, innovate and, and, and expect that the uh, costs will be incurred uh, by the public taxpayers or insurance companies, because that's not going to happen. We've got to figure out a way to be more efficient. And I will argue that personalized medicine is one of those opportunities, though unfortunately, 
we don't have the evidence to show that if we implement personalized medicine regimens, we can not only get better outcomes, I think we can show that uh, in, in, in varied areas, but we can't show that systematically that a, a, a organization like Mayo can actually save money if it does this. It is my hope that we will develop that kind of evidence. And uh, I, I note that, uh, so Mount Sinai, which is in putting a personalized medicine program in place, uh, is also studying what it does to their economy. So that, I think that's important. The benefits of personalized medicine may be well known to you, but it's worth reviewing here. It allows us to diagnose the disease more accurately, to select optimal therapies, and to target medicines and doses more precisely, as we learned uh, in the past couple of days in selected indications. It can increase safety, reduce adverse drug reactions, detect the onset of disease at the earliest moments, which is important for therapy, uh, shift emphasis in medicine from reaction to prevention, uh, and increase the efficiency of the health system by improving quality, accessibility, and affordability. Um, that is the argument for personalized medicine in a nutshell. It's very hard to argue against it, uh, although occasionally we, we come across people who say, uh, well, it's not in my lifetime or it's not worth investing in. I, I, I vigorously disagree with that, and that's why I put this slide up for you to think about. But the fact of the matter is, as we know, uh, major drugs are ineffective for many people. And here's a list uh, based on uh, statistics from 2001 uh, the, where drugs are ineffective. And, and, and I, I could have listed uh, oncology drugs, which are 75% ineffective. So we obviously have a long way to go in, in, in drug development to uh, uh, increase efficacy, uh, if not efficiency. Um, if we extrapolate for those inefficiencies where drugs don't work to the cost and effectiveness of the health system, uh, you'll see on the right the amount of money that could be saved. Now, unfortunately, we don't know who's not going to respond. That's the purpose of getting diagnostic tests in place so that you know who will respond. And it's not only important to get them into place, it's also important to use them. As Dr. Relling explained yesterday, even in pain medication where we do have tests, we don't use the tests. So uh, codeine is prescribed on a one-size-fits-all, uh, and uh, if you have an adverse event, you know, too bad for you. Um, and that leads me to my next slide, which um, uh, I, I actually learned from uh, Dr. Cortese when he gave the State of Personalized Medicine address at the National Press Club uh, a couple of years ago. He noted that uh, the 100,000 100, deaths a year from adverse events is like two super uh, uh, sonic planes going down every week. We wouldn't tolerate it uh, if it weren't one at a time and it weren't in, in medicine. If it were that big a problem, we would organize the energies of the government uh, to, to solve the problem. But we, we don't and, um, and we consequently suffer uh, these adverse events, which are the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. In the old paradigm, uh, we, you, get di you, you get diagnosed, and you select the drug, then you switch the drug, switch the drug again. Um, and if it's in cancer, that's obviously a very bad thing, because you might lose the patient before you get the right drug. Uh, but in, 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 in an illness like depression, it can be particularly painful, where you could go from one SSRI to another. And I would argue that investment in, the, in, 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 and this is ongoing, investment in the diagnostics that tells the psychiatrist in advance uh, which drugs likely to work for which patient based upon that patient's molecular profile would uh, yield a better outcome, obviously, for the patient who doesn't have to switch drugs uh, multiple times. So that you would understand the patient's predisposition, uh, pick the right drug, and then be able to monitor. That, in, ideally, is where we're headed. And yeah, I think you can see why that would appeal to patients. Um, this is a very important slide, uh, and it shows the history of personalized medicine in a way I, I, I think is very important um, to consider when you think about the broader context of what you're doing here at Mayo. Um, 60 years ago, we referred to leukemia 
uh, referred to 38 different leukemias and 51 lymphomas as a disease of the blood. But as we were able to diagnose exactly what the different diseases were, the five-year survival rate went from zero to 70% in those indications. And I would argue that's likely to be where medical progress is tomorrow as well. Uh, this is not by chance. This is where science is pointing us, and this is where, I would argue, uh, we need to go as a society uh, to get better outcomes. Now, it's obvious that uh, the blockbuster model uh, of drug development, which is based upon a one-size-fits-all world, is broken. Uh, John Leichleiter, uh, president and CEO of Eli Lilly, has said the power in tailored therapeutics is for us to say clearly to payers, providers, and patients, this drug is not for everyone, but it is for you. We've got to be saying that more often than we are. Uh, but it's nice to hear a pharmaceutical executive uh, say that that's where the future of his industry is, because 10 years ago, or maybe even less than 10 years ago, the pharmaceutical industry wasn't so keen about personalized medicine. And without their commitment, without their investment, it's obviously gonna happen a lot slower. I would say today that very few companies are not investing in targeted therapeutics and trying to understand the molecular pathways of, uh, of what works for which patients. Um, there's a very unfortunate trend in uh, research and development uh, where we're investing more in R&D and getting fewer new molecular entities um, out of it each year. Now, the bad news is the green line um, is now going down uh, from 2010 when I, the last data I had. Uh, and the blue line, new molecular entities, is increasing. And many of those new molecular entities, as I'll show you in a minute, are actually targeted therapeutics or personalized medicine. But I noted uh, in today's Wall Street Journal, and I assume that um, not all of you read it already this morning, um, that uh, there's a headline right below the government shutting down. Um, the headline is, Merck to cut staff by 20% as big pharma trims R&D. And the article goes on to say that advancements in the understanding of genetics and biology have increasingly fueled drug development in recent decades. Um, and many of the most promising new drugs have been aimed at niche disease populations developed in labs of biotechnology competitors to Merck, considered closer to the cutting edge of science. In short, the article says Merck missed the boat um, and now is paying the price. But I would argue that it's not just Merck, it's the entire industry has been more slow than it should have be to get the science right in order to get the drugs out of the, out of the book door. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Green sh showed us this slide, uh, and, and this slide is very important because it shows that the cost of information is declining. Unlike Dr. Green, I won't tell you what, I, I have no idea what this is gonna mean, other than it's gonna mean something. Because if the cost of information gets down to $1,000 for a genome, we can do a lot more in terms of research. And if we can do a lot more in terms of research, if we get other things right, then it's possible that we can develop therapies that are uh, targeted and, and personalized and more effective than one size fits all. In fact, there may be no alternative. So this is quite good news, unlike the slide I just showed before, which shows that it's gonna be difficult. Now, personalized medicine is actually transforming uh, pharmaceutical R&D. Uh, there are over 400 drugs currently under review at FDA uh, that include biomarkers, uh, and, and, and that's mainly in oncology, and 100 of those um, are in clinical, in, in clinical trials. And many are, are joined together with companion diagnostics, which represent the future of, uh, I, I think, cancer care. Um, and uh, so this is all good news. It, but it's not easy for these companies to change the way they uh, have done business, the way they've done research 
uh, in the past, uh, as exemplified by the Wall Street Journal's Merck story today. Uh, but I believe it is changing, and it's changing rapidly, in part because FDA is sending signals that this is what it wants to see. It wants to see drug development with, uh, with an understanding of the biomarkers that, uh, it work, that those drugs work on, and linked, if, if possible, to a companion diagnostic that would be um, jointly marketed with the drug. Um, so that's, that's where that's headed. Now, as it was pointed out uh, many times in the past couple of days, uh, there, uh, the science underlying uh, cancer care is growing exponentially. And we do understand that uh, uh, cancer is a genetic disease. This slide shows um, the different types of cancer uh, uh, that are linked to particular genetic mutations. And the next slide shows uh, how uh, quickly um, that the discovery of the, of the ALK mutation uh, led to a new drug, Prozotinib, uh, in just four years, whereas um, 20 years ago it took 41 years to move from the discovery of the mutation to, um, to, a, to a new drug. But this is where drug development is, this is where the science is, and, and this is where personalized medicine should be. Uh, this slide shows that um, there are any number now, uh, an increasing number of companion diagnostics. You may recognize many of these labels, um, and they show that drug development is across the industry, uh, and, and they make a real difference for patients, even if they are targeted on niche populations. Zakari or Crizotinib only works for 4% of non-small cell lung cancer patients, uh, and uh, yet Pfizer putting it on the market, uh, uh, al along with uh, Abbott, which developed the diagnostic test, and it works for patients uh, and, and allows patients uh, to stay alive that would not otherwise been the case. Uh, um, so for example, w well, we had, we were trying to educate Congress about uh, about the power of personalized medicine, invited a patient named Stephanie Haney to come uh, to talk to Capitol Hill uh, staffers and congressmen uh, and explain to them how important the corporate R&D that led to the development of that drug was for her. And if you want to read, about, I mean, if you, if you want to read about one patient and how it makes a difference, you go to our newsletter, which was just published online. Uh, at the PMC website, you can see uh, what it means for, for a single individual uh, and, and how important uh, this new revolution in personalized medicine actually is. Um, can, I'm often asked the question, uh, yeah, but can we make any money doing this? I don't always speak to um, uh, audiences of, of academic researchers. Uh, so uh, personalized medicine depends upon uh, investment, uh, and, and investors want to know they can get a return. Uh, so, but it's, it is interesting to note that the, the market for companion diagnostics, uh, drug diagnostic uh, linkages, uh, is, is today at least $12 billion, um, according to LEK, which has studied, LEK is a consulting company, which has studied the phenomenon. Uh, and they also note that this is a growing market uh, m dominated mostly by uh, oncology, but in other indications as well. Um, so I'm optimistic this is going to, this trend is going to continue, but it's not going to continue uh, unless we make it easier for the stakeholders to move into the field. Uh, again, it's not just about the science. Um, how will personalized medicine affect health care? Um, I've tried to put together uh, a sense of where what we're talking about at this conference is likely to impact the various uh, stakeholders. Um, first of all, it's already changing the role of the patient. Uh, the patients today are coming to their physicians with a greater knowledge of genetic risks. There's a lot more discussion of, what, of genetics uh, in, in the public conversation. Um, Patients do understand 
that uh, actionable lifestyle prescriptions reduces the risk of disease. Uh, they can gain greater control uh, and, and, uh, over their medical records, and treatment decisions uh, can be improved uh, by patient education. So there's a movement, a big movement, as everybody knows, away from the uh, physician as an authority and on to, and on to patients uh, as the, the, the determiner of what is good for that particular patient. Ergo, a movement to personalized medicine. And that's what patients think of when they talk about personalized or individualized medicine. Uh, obviously, personalized medicine is changing the role of the healthcare provider. Uh, the physician is now when, and will be more in the future uh, regarded as a manager rather than a repository of medical information. He or she is going to be less artist, more scientist. They cannot rely on memory for everything because there's just too much out there, especially when data is aggregated. And so there'll be greater reliance on uh, health information technologies. Uh, there will be improved care when the data is aggregated. Uh, not, as at Mayo, um, uh, care will be network, team-based, um, and there will be new ethical and legal issues, such as what to do with the patient who doesn't respond, what kinds of therapies should that patient get. Um, as I already mentioned, the pharmaceutical industry uh, will face and is facing uncertain economics of drug development. They haven't figured it out, how they can uh, develop uh, uh, drugs with companion diagnostics that are only good for 4% of the population. Um, it, that's, a, that's a hard sell for a company that's used to sell, trying to sell one size fits all to every, uh, a drug to everybody on the planet. Uh, and regulatory mandates, especially, especially such as those coming from FDA as we speak, are forcing them to move into uh, uh, personalized medicine uh, and then finally, uh, and, and perhaps most importantly, they've got to learn how they can partner with a diagnostic industry that responds to different uh, return on investments, different culture, and, and, and different timelines to success. Um, and that partnership uh, does not come easily. And that's very unfortunate for the future of the field, but it's an obstacle that we need to overcome. Um, there will be, as, as we speak, new demands on payers and from payers to develop personalized medicine. The payers truly, um, I wouldn't say they're the only, they had their hands on the steering wheel because if they don't reimburse or they don't want to pay for something, I wouldn't say it's not going to happen, but I would say it's going to happen more slowly. Uh, there is, uh, from them, much greater emphasis on the clinical utility of everything we do, especially diagnostics. Uh, and I think that's right. We need to be able to show uh, that, that doing a diagnostic test to link to the therapy has clinical utility. You can't just willy-nilly um, ask everybody to get their genome sequenced and not know what you're going to do with that. And I think that came out in the past couple of days. Uh, there is an increased need to demonstrate cost efficiencies. It's not, it's not only necessary to show that you can get better outcomes from uh, a, a new scientific discovery. You gotta show that uh, it's gonna help save the payer money in the long run by, uh, by keeping patients well. Um, there could be, although we haven't seen it yet, proactive strategies to limit reimbursement away from uh, drugs that don't work for selected populations. So they, they, the insurance companies could be saying, and, and, and Medicare could be saying, um, you need to do this test before you give that drug, because um, uh, we know it doesn't work for those people. Uh, and then there will be increased pressure um, to move towards preventive medicine uh, on the grounds that preventive medicine is cheaper than waiting to solve acute problems. And, and that uh, has implications, obviously, for diabetes and, and, and other chronic conditions. Um, John Castellani, president of, uh, CEO of Pharma, uh, has said that we face significant challenges 
uh, in this field. And those challenges are uh, essentially scientific. Although I was encouraged that somebody, I've forgotten who it was, that said they're the least difficult. I, I, I actually think they're the most difficult because science is really hard. Uh, biology is really complex. But just as important and just as difficult are business challenges, which I've alluded to, uh, regulatory challenges, uh, and other policy challenges uh, that we need to address in order to push this paradigm forward. Um, there are multiple uh, policy issues uh, in personalized medicine. I'd like to pause here to reflect on a few of them. Um, because obviously, uh, uh, we're not, as, a, 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 in terms of policy, as fully invested in developing this paradigm as I would wish. So let me just discuss a little bit with you. First of all, um, I would say shutting down the government was a bad idea. Uh, it wasn't good for personalized medicine. Um, and seriously, uh, the cuts at NIH um, served patients very badly. Uh, the NIH provides the bedrock of basic research. Uh, and um, under Francis Collins, there has been an initiative uh, to uh, advance personalized medicine. Uh, and to harness the power of our understanding of the human genome uh, with its implications for uh, uh, a better understanding of how patients respond. So that's, that's a net negative. Um, at CMS, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, there is a movement to, uh, obviously, to contain costs uh, in the belief that uh, at, rightly in the belief that they're out of control and we can no longer afford to spend 17% of GDP on health care. And so containing costs has a mandate. Um, the problem is that they, at CMS in particular, don't understand what we're talking about here, don't see the promise of personalized medicine, don't believe that personalized medicine is going to lead to anything more than increased costs. So they have, for example, just in recent months, and are debating this as we speak, uh, talking about how much they're going to cut molecular diagnostic, reimbursement for molecular diagnostic tests, and have a proposal out to cut those costs for molecular diagnostic tests below the cost of doing the test, never mind the cost of the R&D that develops the test. Now, you don't have to be an economic genius to know that if that happens, you're going to limit access of patients to those tests, and you're going to limit investment in creating the next generation of diagnostic tests that would be developed uh, along with uh, new therapeutics and become the targeted therapies of tomorrow. So that's also a, uh, a, a real challenge uh, that the Personalized Medicine Coalition is trying to face. Uh, another challenge that we have is the movement towards a comparative effectiveness research, which um, is essentially population-based. It essentially looks at what works best uh, for patients on average. President Obama said it allows us to compare the red pill and the blue pill. He said this of, to explain CER. Uh, it allows us to compare the blue pill against the red pill and to see what works best. Well, we know the red pill works for some and the blue pill works for others. That's the problem. Uh, now, there is language in, um, the, in, in the Affordable Care Act that called on comparative effectiveness research to focus on individual variation. And there are opportunities to employ sophisticated comparative effectiveness research uh, to make it support rather than hinder personalized medicine. So that's another example of a public policy that will truly make a difference. And finally, I would mention that the regulatory environment for diagnostics uh, is at best uh, confused. Uh, there are laboratory developed tests which are not uh, such as the 4,000 or, or so that are um, uh, employed here at Mayo Clinic that are not regulated uh, by FDA. Um, 
the pharmaceutical industry is uncomfortable with those. Uh, the kit manufacturers, with those, which those compete with, are uh, uncomfortable. Uh, so we have to sort out uh, how we're going to make it clear to investors and to patients how we deal with these diagnostic tests in order to develop them. So these are examples of public policies which um, either can, as I say, help or hinder the development of personalized medicine. And I would also say, and if you remember one thing from my talk, it's this. What we do in that space between the science and the patient, regulation, reimbursement, comparative effectiveness research, uh, it all makes a difference. Uh, it makes a difference to patients' lives, and it makes a difference uh, to, the, uh, to researchers' lives and, 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 and care providers' lives. So um, that, uh, in a nutshell, is, is what we're working on. There is another barrier to personalized medicine, uh, and it goes back to uh, Machiavelli, uh, who did note that there is nothing more difficult than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things, ergo personalized medicine, because it is a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in those who profit by the old order, and only lukewarm defenders in all those who would profit by the new order. This indifference arises partly from the fear of their adversaries and partly from the incredulity of mankind who truly do not believe in anything new until they have had actual experience of it. I think that insight into human nature is profound and has implications for personalized medicine because we're not going to buy it, we're not going to invest in it, no matter who we are, uh, unless we're a patient, uh, especially if we're a physician or a drug developer or a diagnostic developer, until we can actually experience the change and see that it makes a difference, that it does improve lives, that it does save money, uh, and that patients do better um, in this paradigm. But as I say, I'm optimistic about the future, and uh, as someone said uh, earlier, an optimist is somebody who sees uh, the opportunities in difficulties, and I think that's uh, precisely where we are, and I want to thank you, uh, especially this early in the morning, uh, on the third day of the conference for your time and attention. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> I think that was a good start to the morning. And I notice everybody must be awake because we've already had questions <laughs> pouring in. I've been taking a peek at them backstage. Um, but I'm going to use moderator's prerogative for a minute here, because I have a question or two, Ed. The first one, and it, maybe this seems like you're stating the obvious, but I think it would be worth articulating. Why is it so important to appeal to patients? Well, it, 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 I think it's critical to appeal to patients. I look forward to the day, as, as I said, when patients demand uh, personalized treatment because they think they can get it. I think the medical establishment writ large, is, and, and, the, and, the, and the industry, is relatively conservative. They don't want to necessarily make investments until they have to. So I look forward to demand from below in order to push the paradigm forward. And I think patients are, are a massive untapped force. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, let me give you a chance for a quick uh, commercial here, which is, since we've got all of these folks present, representing so many prestigious organizations. What can academic medical centers, academic institutions do to help the Personalized Medicine Coalition? What do you need? No, thank you very much for that question. Uh, first of all, the, the coalition is a voice on behalf of personalized medicine. So it obviously depends on participation uh, and commitment to join in and creating that voice that we support change, even if we disagree about actually which direction we should go in. Um, in America especially, but I think internationally as well, um, 
you, you need to be able to define what it is you want to do in order to persuade policymakers, not just in government, but also in industry and academia, to actually make the change that is going to be necessary along the lines I was trying to outline. Okay. So joining the coalition is critical. Join and the moreover, participate. Participate, that's what I was going to say. And Mayo, by the way, does participate. Yes, uh, yes, great. Um, let's go to a few of these audience questions. There was one here that said that you spoke of the amount of education that is needed. And perhaps you can share with us how the coalition is trying to help on the education front. Well, we, the, the, especially regarding education, we call ourselves an education and advocacy organization with an emphasis on education. As I noted from the beginning, uh, most people uh, don't know what personalized medicine is. Uh, I imagine even if you walk a couple blocks down the street in Rochester, the, the average person won't know what personalized medicine is. So there's an enormous amount of educational effort that needs to be done to explain what it is uh, and so that patients will be, have a better understanding of what to expect from their providers in the future and also f what to expect from themselves. Uh, as I indicated, it does change the role of the patient uh, a little bit to know that what he or she brings to the table uh, uh, in terms of their lifestyles and, and in terms of their genetics uh, is going to make a difference in their health in the future. So education, I, I actually think, is critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit uh, toward the end of your presentation about the Affordable Care Act. You mentioned some of the comparative effectiveness provisions in there, PCORI. Uh, this questioner also, uh, again, I think wants you to elaborate a little bit more on the ACA implications and specifically calls out the emergence of accountable care organizations asking um, what will be the, the impact on personalized medicine, if any. Well, that's a great question, and um, we are optimistic uh, uh, that the accountable care organizations, recognizing that they have got to contain costs and hopefully will not want to do that by rationing care or limiting effectiveness, will try to figure out ways that they can improve quality and keep costs down. One answer for that is obviously personalized medicine, giving the right drugs to the right patients at the right time. Um, they're not required to do that. Uh, it remains to be seen whether they buy into it. It remains to be seen whether our educational work is successful. Uh, and that's why what's going on at, uh, the, at, the, um, at Mayo and, and its Center for Individualized Medicine is so important. Um, I'm encouraged, uh, I, but it is an experiment, uh, and, and we've got to see uh, how it plays out. Uh, but this, this indeed is the key question. Um, uh, otherwise, the Accountable Care Act uh, is agnostic about personalized medicine. Um, and now that's interesting because I, I don't know how well known it is, but President Obama, when he was uh, a junior senator from Illinois, had a bill in Congress to advance personalized medicine. But I think, uh, given all the other complexities and, and contentions around the Affordable Care Act, they decided that uh, discussing genetics was probably not a political win. <laughs> I, I was there for a lot of those discussions, and they, they did indeed have their hands full just, just with the ACA. I think genetics might have been a little too much for Congress on that, that day. Um, but it's interesting when you talk about the ACOs, because really, as you point out, the incentive for all of the players in an ACO is to deliver, as, as you say, that higher quality at a more affordable cost. And I think education is a piece of it, but do you also think that those organizations are going to need some help kind of bringing the personalized medicine component into the practice? Yes, I do. And I actually think that one of the rate limiting problems we have right now is we don't have enough evidence. We don't have enough experience, as I alluded to with the quote from Machiavelli, that this actually works, that you can touch it, feel it, see it, and get, the better, and get better results. Uh, and I, I know, especially in medicine, there's no substitute for evidence. Now, a key issue is what levels of evidence are going to be acceptable for what purposes. So FDA has one level of evidence, CMS has another level of evidence, American Heart Association has another level of evidence. I think we've got to get together and decide 
what, what, what we need and how much does it cost to develop the evidence to make change. Because if you need a controlled randomized clinical trial for every single diagnostic test, well, guess what? You're not going to have any because the return on investment is just not there. Mm. So we need to think this through. Uh, several questions here relating to insurance companies or payer, payer agencies, and I don't want anyone to blame the messenger here. I'm reading your questions. So with that, uh, this person asks, representatives of payers are notably absent from personalized medicine conferences, with the exception of the occasional invited speaker. What can be done? What is the Personalized Medicine Coalition doing to get them more engaged? Well, that too is a very interesting question. Um, they are members of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. I would say they are the least engaged in, in promoting the paradigm of personalized medicine. And part of that I've determined uh, is cultural. They have a business model that requires them to watch the game but not participate in it. Uh, they want the evidence brought to them that they should make changes. But they're not research and development uh, oriented, so they're not investing uh, for cultural and historic reasons in trying to affect change. Um, and I, I, I think that's rate limiting for the field. I wish it were otherwise, uh, but that's just where they're coming from. Now, I would argue that they all know what's going on. They're paying very close attention. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I guess part, another part of it is human nature. They don't like to come to these conferences and get beat up. <laughs> <laughs> we promise we'll, we'll, be, we'll be nice next time. If uh, they, are there any conference. payers in the room? Are there, do you want to raise your hands, payers? All right, well, I do see a few brave, brave souls. Thank you. And, and I do think it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult, challenging environment for them right now as well. There are so many of the, the cost pressures uh, that, that they are grappling with and, and looking for solutions. And I would suspect that sometimes the personalized medicine paradigm seems like a far off solution to companies that often have to answer quarterly to shareholders. I, th I, think, I think that's correct, and, they, uh, and as you note, they are facing, uh, along with governments, very severe problems in containing costs. And they, absent evidence, are skeptical about the power of personalized medicine not to increase costs. I think at bottom they think that, uh, you know, the, uh, that every new diagnostic test is going to just add to, the to add to the cost of health care. Right. And, and they don't see where this is all going absent evidence, which is why that's so important. Ed, I love your phrase about the space between the science and the patient. I think that's a, a great image to kind of reflect upon. And I think one of these questions gets at that a little bit as well. It says, what are your recommendations for speeding clinical trials along to introduce drugs into the market or larger phase trials more quickly? Um, I, I think that's very important, and uh, actually Janet Woodcock at FDA uh, has said that uh, we ought to be considering single-arm clinical trials uh, based on observation. Um, she knows, and, and interesting, she's the head of drug evaluation at uh, FDA, and she knows this is a radical proposal, uh, but she also knows that the cost of clinical trials is very large, that uh, we need to get them developed quicker so that we can get drugs to patients more quickly. Uh, and she also knows that you can see things if you have understood the, the population you're studying at the molecular level, you can actually see things that are working. And she's fond of, of uh, quoting um, the scientists who discovered that you didn't need a controlled randomized clinical trial to figure out if a parachute worked. <laughs> um, so I'm optimistic that FD, under, under her guidance at FDA, we may be able to push this new paradigm along a little bit more 
quickly, and we do have to figure out other ways of doing these clinical trials. Although, as you notice, uh, noted, at, at the moment, they're shut down. So the first thing they've yeah. got to do is, is open back up for business, right? Uh, it'll be fun for us to go home to Washington. <laughs> uh, a good question here from the audience. How can community physicians or community hospitals introduce personalized medicine into their practices when they don't have access to so much of the really complex research activity that's taking place in this field. We've, we've heard variations on this theme throughout the conference, and I think it's very good because it's phenomenal to be here at Mayo Clinic, but not every community hospital can be a Mayo Clinic. Well, that, it's a very important question because 85% uh, of cancer care takes place outside of academic health centers in community hospitals. So the question is how are these community, 85 percent of patients going to have access to the new discoveries in genomic medicine. Um, the good news there is there are companies that are trying to figure out how to translate w discoveries in places like Mayo to the community hospital and make it available uh, in, uh, in, in HIT systems to those uh, hospitals, and uh, so I'm, again, optimistic that uh, we'll be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Great. But it's, very, it's a very important question, and does get back to the whole question of, of education and why it's so important that we uh, not just talk to ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, looks like we have time for maybe a, a couple more here. Uh, another one, why don't payers demand genetic tests before physicians can prescribe certain drugs? Wouldn't this be more cost effective? Well, actually, indeed, some of them are. Um, they, they uh, so for uh, Herceptin, for example, requires a genetic test, right. and payers want to see it. And they also want acknowledgement that the patient uh, who is not going to respond to Herceptin, isn't going to be prescribed it. Um, that's an example of where and they do require And that's, of course, it. a very expensive drug. Very expensive drug, right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was saying about the payers earlier. I would expect that they would be more proactive to get these tests. But they've got, again, they've got to see the evidence and they've got to believe that it, that it will work. Um, but many of them are now contracting with uh, genetic, with companies that perform genetic tests perform it on their behalf uh, to make sure that the, that the right drugs are going to the right people. And it seems to me, and this is not just uh, genetic, but m more broadly speaking, what we've been observing out of the FDA more lately is an inclination to approve in tandem a diagnostic test and a therapy. And there are a couple of companies that in particular are really sort of focused on that strategy. Right. Another, uh, this is, again, in the education theme, which, which is so important, and um, it asks, how do you see social media playing a role in patient education of personalized medicine? And I, I'm, I know that you have a website. Does your coalition also kind of tap into social media? Well, we're ex I, I'm unfortunately the oldest person in my office. It's, it's not unfortunate. <laughs> it's wisdom uh, but we we are uh, we, we're experimenting with social media and obviously we know we need to do a better job of especially if when when the personalized medicine coalition decides to move from educating the elites which still aren't buying into this yet mm -hmm. to educating general populations we know we're going to need things like video uh, and Twitter and and, and all the other social media to get patients to think about demanding more of their healthcare system that makes it more personalized. But as I said, based on our focus groups, we think that's not going to be an impossible uh, assignment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it requires resources and investment, and, and that's something that we don't have a lot of right now. Right. We, Personalized Medicine Coalition doesn't travel faster than the field. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, uh, final question, if, if you can. This one uh, might be a little bit challenging, but there seems to be an emphasis on educating, this says, an older population, and in parentheses, post-high school, post-college. I don't really think of that as old, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Is anything being done to begin educating individuals earlier about the importance of personalized medicine and preventive medicine? I think you spoke to the strategy of kind of targeting the elites first for some, yeah. some obvious reasons, but in this question, they do also ask about preventive medicine, and it seems that might be a good message for young people. No, I, I think that's exactly right, and we need, we, we need to focus on preventive medicine. Uh, and we need the evidence that it actually will work. Unfortunately, again, with preventive medicine, there's not a lot of evidence that shows that mm -hmm. if you do the following things, you're unlikely to uh, develop some horrendous disease later in life, uh, as intuitive as that might be. But that kind of education, it seems to me, is gonna be between the physician uh, or provider and the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we need to get that into uh, the medical curricula, I believe. Great. Well, please thank, join me in thanking Ed Abrahams. Thanks.